Hey listeners, we're nearing the end of our 15th anniversary fundraising campaign and we need your help to meet our goal. This campaign offers you a chance to win a unique food and music experience in one of the most exciting cities in America. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and you'll be entered to win dinner for two and two tickets to a concert in one of eight amazing cities. New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Ardmore, Pennsylvania, and Asheville. All donations support our work educating food system storytellers. And when you donate, you can choose one of those cities and you'll be entered to win dinner and two tickets to a show. So help us reach our goal and enter to win dinner and a show in the city of your choice. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Heritage Radio Network is food radio supported by you. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Somerset County Tourism. Hear stories from local brewers and distillers from the New Jersey Sip and Sea Trail on episode 647 of Beer Sessions Radio, wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to The Great Nation, your weekly wine journey. Our guest is Karen McNeil. We'll talk to Karen about the newly updated third edition of the Wine Bible, Wine Speed, and a lot more. I'm your host, Sam Ben Ruby. Stay with us for The Great Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. We bring wine to the people. Karen McNeil is an award-winning wine speaker, consultant, journalist, educator and author, among other things. When I say award-winning, I'm talking about an Emmy and a James Beard Award, among others. She has her own line of stemware and publishes her weekly newsletter and website, Wine Speed. Karen just released the fully revised and updated third edition of the Wine Bible yesterday. The Wine Bible has sold a million copies and is one of the best all-time selling wine books. Welcome back to the Great Nation, Karen. Hi, Sam. I want to remind you that you were last on the Great Nation in February of 2017, which was a while ago. And I mean, you and I have been around wine a lot. We've drank a lot. You know, we've done a lot. But that was only my 17th episode of the podcast. So I was a neophyte. Now I'm an old experienced <laughs> All right, so we're talking to Karen remotely um, via our uh, app Zencaster. So, Karen, where are you right now? I am in my office right in the heart of the Napa Valley in the little town of St. Helena. Okay, that's a very cool town. Now, how long have you been out there? Um, let's see. I moved from New York to Napa Valley in 1994. Well, so it's been a while. And I kind of know the answer and you've, you've talked about it, but, but why did you then make your way there? Yeah, you know, it was, um, of course, my friends were shocked. They were like, wait, wait a minute, where are you going? But I, I believed that somehow being closer to grapevines would make me a better writer. I, um, you know, it was kind of, um, I don't, I just couldn't, um, how to put this? It seemed very unreal to me that there you are sitting in Manhattan, all dressed up, you're not anywhere near a grapevine, but you're taking notes and kind of passing judgment on wines. And um, it almost seemed, I suppose, a little unfair to me. And I, I decided that to really know wine better, I, I needed to be really in it more. I needed to, through maybe through osmosis, be around farmers and winemakers and viticulturalists and pick up through osmosis 
um, some of the things they knew. So um, it's funny you say yeah. that because I was going to use the word osmosis. But yeah. was 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 California the obvious choice, or you pondered over a few things? No, you know, I uh, I knew um, once I decided that I wanted to be in wine country, I knew it was going to be Napa Valley. Um, I, there are so many other parts of uh, wine in the United States and regions that I love. I adore the Willamette Valley in Oregon. I think the Walla Walla um, region of Washington State is just on fire with such excitement and lots of young new producers. But for me, um, you know, the pull of Napa, which is small and so beautiful, was was very strong. So uh, it's funny you say that because I think Napa is what really drew me into wine, you know, in a deep way. Um, with my wife, you know, way back in the 90s, we became drinkers, collectors. We paid attention to everything. Do you still feel the same way? about what's going on in Napa, Sonoma that you did, you know, the 15, 20, 25 years ago since you've been there? Yes, I do. Because, you know, I, I think when you become as famous as Napa Valley, you also become the, the object of lots of criticism. So, you know, so many journalists just love to... I don't know, bash Napa Valley as the most capitalistic wine region. Prices are so high. Big corporate um, wineries are here. And I think people get that story wrong. Um, and I think it's unfair to, um, to, tell, well, to tell denigrate. Me why. What's the wrong part? Um, Napa is not, 95% of all of the wineries here are family owned and produce fewer than 5,000 cases of wine. So it is not some, uh, you know, center of enormous corporate influence. Right. Of course, there are um, a couple of big wineries, Behringer, Mondavi, but 95% of the 500 wineries here packed into one little 30 mile long valley, you can imagine they're small. Yeah, that's and, a fair point. And they have, um, and in Sonoma, it's, it's absolutely true. Most of the wineries are small and family owned. Even more and than so, Napa, right? Uh, well, yes, because Sonoma is much larger than Napa. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I think the values that made those two regions what they are today are still there. And um, I, I love these two regions. I think that's well said. And I think that's a reason for people to pay attention to the, re to the region and, you know, look deeper, you know, look beyond, you know, those big wineries. Cause you're right. I mean, there's a lot of exciting stuff there. Um, all right. So before we get into the wine Bible, cause that's why I chased you down. Um, tell me, I'm always curious what people are doing. Tell me what you've been focusing most of your time on since you finished the book. I'm guessing that, you know, there was a big run up to the book, working, getting it done, deadlines and all that. That ends. It's almost like a wedding. You wake up the next day. What do I do now? I know you're going to go out and promote it. But tell me tell me what you've been focusing your time and energy on. Since well, then. you know, one thing is writing a book, researching and writing it. And this third edition of the Wine Bible took about four years to to write. Um, but then when you're done, most people think, OK, you're done. You've 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 written the last word. But in point of fact, you have another couple of years where you have to kind of turn your baseball cap around or something and and really work incredibly hard at um, going out, meeting people, getting them excited about wine um, and, of course, selling your book at the same time. So um, there's a lot of exciting promotional work that I'm doing now. And, you know, not every writer really likes to do that because if you, right. if you imagine writing itself is very solitary um, 
and you know you're you're just with yourself all uh, through all of those thousands and thousands of hours. Right. But then when you start to promote the book, you're really out there with people. And um, so it's quite a different um, feeling. But also my business here in um, the Napa Valley, uh, we do, writing is only one part of it. We do a lot of private tastings for for companies and for corporations and for major law firms and tech firms and right. medical firms and insurance firms. So we've, so always, we've always got lots of events going on. Yeah. So, so that's great. Cause you're always out there, you're with people, you're gauging what they're, you know, thinking and doing, um, and you're tasting wines. Um, you know, what kind of jumped at me when you were talking about, you know, once you wrote the book, what you have to do after you're way more famous now <laughs> releasing this book than when you did the first book. So that has to help, right? Yeah, you know, I I suppose it uh, it does. But when the first wine Bible came out in two thousand and one, uh, you're right. I was not very well known, but no American had really ever written a big wine book before. All of the big wine books had been written by British authors, so. Um, I think, you know, the Wine Bible immediately got a lot of attention because it was very different than the way um, the big British wine books had been written. So you've said this in the past. Um, You you didn't think you knew wine journalism was a male dominated, you know, thing. Um, and you certainly alluded to that, you know, you even drilled it down a little, those a bunch of old British guys or whatever. Um, so you're a woman in wine and, you know, thank God women in wine are way more prominent and, you know, equally accepted, although there's still a ways to go. Do you still think wine journalism is male dominated? And do you think the perceptions of wine consumers are based on that, you know, wine male domination writing? Um, the, the world is losing wine writers, um, whether they're men or women. Okay. It's increasingly hard. Um, in fact, virtually impossible now to make a living as to make a, a living solely by writing. There are now in the United States only two newspapers left that have a wine writer, a full-time wine writer on that, uh, salary. San Francisco and New York? San Francisco and New York. Um, and Esther in, and Eric. Yep. Uh, Esther Mobley and then Eric Asimov. So, you know, I, I don't worry very much anymore about if a writer is male or female, I just want there to be writers um, because it's very important to a wine culture that, um, that, that the, that uh, communication about wine is spread. And if you didn't have writers who would do that? All right. So this segues into something that I'm very interested in hearing from you about And that's social media and the internet. We'll get into that a little. Um, I want to get a sense how both, you know, the internet and then social media came around, how they changed wine and how now you work as a digital wine writer. And to the point you made before that, there's two newspaper wine writers but I think you and I can agree there's like trillions of wine bloggers or, you know, however you describe them, whether it's a social media post or somebody has an extensive site. You know, so give me your views on, on, on social media and the Internet, because we're going to talk about how you use them to um, change yeah, for the better. You know, t- t- tell me your thoughts. Well, on the one hand, it's um, blogging and creating your own website has been fantastic because it's allowed so many more voices to to be heard, and that is a categorically good thing. 
Um, I, I guess, though, what always worries me, what worries me is, is, is two ideas, are two ideas. One is that um, a lot of young bloggers, it seems to me, immediately set themselves up as experts. And right. in, I don't know, in my old fashioned way, I guess I think, no, you know, it takes a long time to learn about wine. And, <clears throat> and in a way, you have to earn your way uh, there. You can't just instantaneously become um, an expert because you have a blog. On the other oh, hand, wait, a I lot of blogs. To, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I want to hash that out a little. But, so, you know, anybody could go and do a blog. You know, you as a writer, you know, me as a podcast journalist, and then the consumer, just because somebody has a blog and they're writing about wine, does that implicitly make them an expert? I mean, is the consumer that silly where, you know, they're, they're well, no, the consumer shouldn't be. And and to be fair to bloggers, a lot of bloggers, of course, don't uh, suggest that they're experts. Okay. They simply suggest that, you know, I'm a person who loves wine. And here are some of the things I've discovered. And um, I'd like to share them with you. And all of that is very, very valid and wonderful. As I was saying, I think the 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 part that gives me pause sometimes, and in fact, the reason I created Wine Speed, is that um, you know any any writer who does a lot of research knows that if you've got tough editors, and I feel like I have had the, some of the toughest editors in the world, right. those editors really put you through your paces. You have got to be able to prove to them. Um, how you know what you've written, and you've got a you are fact checked in every possible way. And one of the things that the internet has done has given us lots of information, lots of opinions, um, lots of communication about wine, much of which never is fact checked. So um, I feel like. Uh, that's what I miss. Sometimes when I, you know, read a, a blog, I think, wait a minute, this this just simply isn't true. If this person had done any bit of research, they would know that this is not true. Um, and and that makes me worried a little bit. So I guess I, in the end, I think social media and wine blogging is both wonderful and also um, a little dangerous. I, you know, I, I agree with that. And I agree that whether it's a retailer, a psalm in a restaurant, um, a wine store, that you have to find the right source and trust them. And that's easier said than done. But when you do, you know, if you come to Karen McNeil's wine speed versus some guy who's just blathering, you know, you're going to be able to differentiate that. What you stated is what's been going on in, the, on in the internet. I mean, politics, it's been documented the last five years, you know, how social media and the internet have been so distorted, you know, towards disseminating information. So you see the positives there and there's definitely some negatives. Agree? Definitely. And, you know, I'm thinking just like writing, what what has happened uh, to just take this one step further is I think there there is a kind of a, a a group of bloggers who are really at the top of their game who really do um, they they fact check themselves they may not have an editor but they they've become well enough known and they themselves have high enough standards that um, that their voices are are expert and um, and what they bring to the world of wine is very valuable. Um, so, yeah, and I, I just wish that some of those voices had the opportunity to write also for magazines and newspapers. I mean, in the 80s and 90s, the, those two decades were just great decades for um, magazines all over the country yeah. on so many it topics. It was way more analog, but it was great. Yeah. It was fabulous. And writers um, could be hired by those magazines. And, 
you know, that's largely gone away. Um, so I don't know. I'm, I'm a little well, sad for, to miss those I, days. I am sad too. There is a point where, you know, when the right people are out there doing the right thing, it's democratized a little, but then you lost that whole aspect of, you know, what you've been describing. And, you know, that is very sad. It's a changed world. Do you feel that you're comfortable? You felt you've done it right? You know, your pivot from, you know, really being back there as a wine writer to now somebody who's, you know, in a digital world? Because I'll say it for you. I mean, you're releasing one of the most wildly popular books and you have a very successful digital website. So you're doing both. I mean, was the pivot easy, reasonable for you? Well, pivot implies to me that you've gone from one thing and you're now in a completely different direction. So take pivot away, enhancing or adding or, you know, doing more. No, I I felt that um, in a way I feel like Wine Speed and the Wine Bible are, they're just two sides of the same coin. One is, um, you know, a 700 page book. And the other is something that is so fast, comes to your email every Friday. You can read it in three minutes. It's really fun and fascinating. Um, And uh, so I I love both of these um, entities. And um, it's not that I'm giving up the Wine Bible to do more wine speed. I actually see them as being, um, I don't know, like siblings in a way. But isn't it fair to say wine speed is a way for you to communicate with people on a regular basis? Oh, you definitely. Know, you're, you're able to stay current, like you said, literally day to day, you know, shoot stuff out, stuff out. So let's talk about wine speed. You know, give my peeps the elevator pitch. You know, wine <laughs> speed is an important baby of yours. But, you know, to tell people... You know, it's Karen McNeil, but here's what Karen's doing. This is my wine speed, and here's what I'm doing here. Well, it's it's a digital newsletter. It's free, um, which is important. And um, every week on a Friday, you get an email from us. And um, it is, you know, it's very graphic and uh, easy to read. And I began it in 2016 with the goal of, um, kind of keeping uh, wine at the top of people's mind just a little bit every week. And so um, we have about 40,000 subscribers. Wow. Um, every week we do a wine question and people, a quiz actually, and people love the quiz. They are. Oh, can you recall a recent one? Just give me, give me an idea of, you know, one of the questions. Oh my goodness. Let's I knew see. you were going to. What was a uh, a recent um, quiz? Oh, we might ask um, where is uh, what in what country is most of the Cabernet Sauvignon in the world grown? Okay. So it's it's often a you know a question that you think you know the answer to, but then um, you find that there's kind of a a twist, like, oh, who knew? You would say uh, California or Bordeaux. What's the answer? Well, there are, uh, we, would, we would say California, Bordeaux, uh, Chile, and Chile. maybe Australia, right, to make right. it a little bit harder. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, I'm not going to tell you the answer. Sam, you have, to, you have to subscribe to Wine Speed. Well, I started uh, looking at it when I knew I was going to be <laughs> But I didn't sign up for it. You know, I'm a lurker, but why wouldn't I go on it? Um, um, I'm always the business guy. Why a free model? I mean, you have other ways to monetize it or it helps you support everything else you're doing? Well, um, you know, we've debated, to be honest, uh, here in my office, whether or not we should charge for it. But um, I feel a kind of um, obligation to give back and to, um, you know, when you, when you teach people, when you're a teacher, when you're an educator, um, everyone knows that teachers do not make a lot of money. Um, 
it's Not because fair. of your, yeah, it's, it's your love of teaching. And so um, at least so far, this has been uh, a way of giving back to um, the industry that I love. And it allows a lot of people um, to, you know, there's no barrier to, to getting wine speed. It's, um, it's free, it's fun, it's fast, um, and, and we like it that way. Karen, I think that's awesome. Um, let's tell people, if, if I'm listening to this and I'm like, Jesus, why wouldn't I do that? Tell me exactly what I do. I go onto my computer. I go to winespeed.com. Right. And uh, a little um, box will pop, pop up and it will say, would you like to subscribe? Okay. And you put your email in and, and you're done. That's uh, it. Next, so it's the next Friday, speed, you'll start word. getting it. Wine That's speed, great. one word. That's great. Um, before we get into the book, um, I want to ask you a couple more things. I know because I've seen them and noticed them, you've been doing some video um, tasting type stuff, you know, starting to do it on a regular basis. Tell me about that. Yes. We... Is, is it tasting with Karen? It's called uh, Taste with Karen Live. Taste with Karen, right. Um, and uh, yes, we do all kinds of live virtual tastings, which, by the way, are also free and another wonderful way to learn about wine. You know, Sam, I want to say, too, that um, all of our videos are live virtual tastings and videos. We did begin to do those during the height of the COVID pandemic, okay. actually at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Right. So remember, people were um, sheltering it in place, right? People were stuck at home. And um, I felt also that this would be a wonderful thing to do. You, you might not be able to go out and take a wine class, but you could join these live virtual tastings again for free and kind of help you get through those, you know, all that solitude of the pandemic and learn a little bit about wine at the same time. So I think what's we, cool about that is a lot of people did that and disappeared. What's yeah. nice is you did it and you're still doing it, yes, you know, and we, you're the right did. guy to do it. You know, it's like, thank God you're continuing um, in that sense. Cause I think there's an appetite um, for that type of interaction and that type of inter information. Um, I think you would agree. So yes. how do we find that? Taste with yeah, Karen. So all of the live virtual tastings that we do um, are once you sign up for wine speed, you'll see every wine speed okay. there is uh, there will be links in there to attend. Uh, we'll describe the next live virtual tasting we're going to do and when it is and it gives you a, a link right there so that you can join um, very easily when the time comes. So Wine Speed is a good portal to go to for all things Karen. It is. Okay. So then we gave people the information. Um, I want to ask you a very general question, and we probably could do a whole show on it, but I want you to jog your uh, brain, your mind, and just you know figure out a couple things. Um, what's going on in the wine world that's caught your attention these days? You know, and, and this is, you know, you're a person, you know, you've done three editions of the wine library, you're pumping out content on a site. What what's what's going on now that, you know, you think about or you have to further research or you have to travel? Is there anything, you know, that pops to the top of that list? Any few things? Well, as a generalist, you know, a lot of people who write about wine are specialists because Right. The, the world of wine is so big at this point. Um, so I feel like I'm one of the last generalists. And hopefully I know as much about New Zealand as I know about Hungary, as I know about Oregon, as I know about California. Um, it's So I'm all the time trying to keep current uh, very broadly across the world. But one thing I think um, that anyone who loves wine has to be thinking about is climate chaos. Yes. And it's more than just 
climate change at this point. Right. It's really chaos in wine regions around the world. The other day, I came across a statistic that said that wine grapes could be extinct in the next 28 years. That's this was from wow. this was from a very very uh, top notch source, and I thought, oh my god, that is astounding. The the major wine regions that we know right now: Bordeaux, Burgundy, Napa Valley, Tuscany. All of those major wine regions will be the the ability to grow grapes will be reduced by seventy. Five percent in the next twenty years. That's so. Crazy. Yes, and and the wine industry is doing some things about that. We're um, using things like shade cloth and changing varieties in certain places, right. or planting hybrids, or looking at um, you know different viticultural techniques. But my right. fear is that it could be uh, uh, too little, too late. Um, yeah, well, that's, is, that's, that's the big argument. You know, you've drilled it down to, you know, uh, wine growing, wine making, the wine business. But I, I think the world is, you know, in a similar boat. Um, and like I said, I mean, we, we could do multiple shows on that. But I'm glad that that's the thing that's, you know, looming because I want everyone to be aware. And the word chaos you know, is right. I mean, it, it's it's thrown a lot of people in the wine business into chaos um, with early frost, you know, England becoming a sparkling wine, <laughs> mini Mecca, you know, all these things going on. So, you know, I would love to follow up. And there's discussion of that in the book. All right, Karen, we have to take a quick break. When we come back, I want to talk to you about the book, and there's a lot to talk about, and I hope I can get to the important stuff. So we are talking to Karen McNeil. Karen just released her third edition of the Wine Bible. Um, when we get back, we're going to get into that. You're listening to The Grape Nation on the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Jimmy Carboni, host of Beer Sessions Radio on HRN. I recently hosted a live podcasting event with local beer and spirits makers from beautiful Somerset County, New Jersey. We spoke on the farm that is home to Flounder Brewery and Belmar Distillery, one of the most beautiful stops along the Sip and See Craft Beverage Trail. To me, those two worlds, brewery and distillery, are extremely complementing businesses, especially in a unique location like this. So it immediately helped this become a destination to have a great experience whether it's the beer atmosphere we've got going in here on the old barns or the great experience you can have in there with these incredible cocktails that are created there it's complementary to each other you can have two completely different experiences all within a 10-foot walk from each other before the event i was able to tour the area and see the historic bridge tenders house along the serene dnr canal walk the bike and hiking trails and take in the lush farmland. Then we settled into the centuries-old Dutch barn turned brewery for a lively discussion. It was always important for us to create our space, our livelihood that we want to share with everybody else, of being a community-centric location. It is what makes us a brewery in this state different from a barn or restaurant. Um, you know, we're obviously family-friendly here. Um, we have a lot of different groups that have their meetings here during the week. We just really want to become a community hub. You can listen to this episode of Beer Sessions Radio, available wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again to Somerset County Tourism for supporting this episode. Learn more about the Sip and See Passport Program at visitsomersetnj.org. That's visit S-O-M-E-R-S-E-T-N-J dot org. Okay, we're back. We're back with my guest, Karen McNeil. Karen, yesterday, and I'm happy to have her on the next day, released um, her third edition of the Wine Bible. Um, let's get the vitals out of the way. Whenever somebody writes a book, there's always a few things that I'm curious about, and I think people 
you know, are curious about. So at what point do you decide you needed to update the last edition and get out a third edition? Is it because I want to buy a new house and I need money or <laughs> a lot has happened since and I got to write about it? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's because I want to buy a new house I and know, I need I the money joking. because there's a lot of easier ways to make money than writing giant True. books like the Wine you, Bible. You laid but, that out. Yes. Um, uh, you know, Sam, it's a bit of a, a sense. You're, you're, you know, as a writer, you, you try and be a barometer of what's happening in the wine world. And so it's a sense that uh, things have changed enough that you really need to um, redo what had been already a, a very big work. Um, and knowing, by the way, that it w it's going to take years, not not days and not months, but years to do. I suppose so the you other said, thing... You said you, you've been working on this for four years. Yes. So you started about four years ago and you sensed around then um, that it was time. But are things moving at a quicker pace now? I mean, the wine world is, is different than it was 10, 15 years ago, moving differently? Yes, it's quicker. moving much faster, in part because uh, technology is moving so fast. Right. So, um, you know, technology has, for example, uh, opened up all of Asia to, to wine, not only just wine production, but, um, you know, your listeners will be probably familiar with WSET, Wine and Spirits Education Trust. Right. And um, one out of every 1,000 people in Hong Kong have taken a WSET exam at this point. One out of every 1,500 people in Singapore have taken a WSET exam. So wine knowledge is just, just flying around the globe. Um, and that has, uh, that's expanded the world of wine and the culture of wine. Uh, that, that's only for the better. Definitely. So started four years ago, took you about four years. It took you, I think you said, 10 years to write the first book? Exactly. I'm getting twice as fast. But the first book was written um, largely without the benefit of the internet. And right. uh, people uh, perhaps forget that before the internet, how did you do global research, right? You had to either go there, um, and I've been to most wine regions in the world, or you did your research by phone and by fax. You didn't just quickly look up how many wineries are there in Hungary by Googling it. There was right. no Google. Isn't that um, crazy what you had to do then and what you can do now? Yes. And it took so everything that you were trying to learn to teach yourself and then ultimately to teach others took. Um, sometimes many months of finding the right experts uh, who you could talk to and interview. Um, that is, uh, I mean, that has been uh, just an enormous change. In but there's something to that when you can get right to the source though, right? Uh, yes. Well, that's right. I mean, and it, it's also true that the internet um has a lot of uh, not very or accurate information or conflicting information. Right. So you still might have to get to the person who is, in fact, an expert on a given topic. But right. to find that person is a lot easier because you can at least use Google to find that person. So one tool in a good way is you need to get to that person, but this helps you get to them. It's more important to find them than to get information about them. I kind of agree with that too. Um, you know, you had mentioned climate change. Um, when you first wrote the book, and what is that, 20 years ago? We're talking all in? When was the first book written? Mm -hmm. 20, so, uh, 2001. Yeah. I mean, we're going into 2023, over 20 years. 
you talked about climate change, but do, do any other compelling changes or storylines come to mind since you set out to write that first book? That's a broad loaded question because you cover a lot of region countries and the regions and things have happened. But again, does anything pop to the top of the list? I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question. I mean, the, the world of wine is much, much bigger. So, um, you know, uh, I had to kind of get my arms around a much uh, bigger um, amount of information, types of wines, um, character of wines. And then um, in addition, in this new edition, I also went back to the past um, more in a chapter I call um, Ancient Wine, um, Wine at, um, in the Very Beginning, which was a really fascinating chapter to, to research and write. Right. Um, so I, I guess the answer to that is, and not everything gets bigger, but the, the wine world got incredibly bigger and the coverage of it, you know, required a lot more. So, I mean, that, that's fair. Um, I mean, this book, it's larger size-wise. You know, it's, I think your biggest book size-wise. It has more pages. What did you say? It was about 800 pages? Yes. And it's now in color, um, mm-hmm. which you take for granted. But, I mean, it makes the experience, um, you know, so much uh, better, you know, when you because wine's a very colorful thing in, in many ways. Um, you follow a format in the book. I mean, there's a lot of information history, but you you cover at least 23 winemaking countries and their numerous you know regions within them. Um, you have a format in each chapter. So let's talk to our listeners and listen. Here's an opportunity to delve into all these countries and their regions. You know, Italy has Tuscany, Piedmont, and you know so on and so forth. But when you get to each section. You basically make sure formatically, you know, that you cover a few things. Tell me how you design the chapters that way. I mean, you know, you do the history and quick zip. You always talk about grapes. Mm -hmm. You know, tell tell me what, you you, you know, the the information you're always going to get. I think when you, there are two ways to write a book. One is or two ways to write anything about wine. One is to say, um, here's what I know. Here's where I went. Too bad you weren't there, <laughs> kind of. The other is, and the way that I write, is to turn the binoculars around a little bit and think, what would someone want to know? What would be helpful to them to know? If that person were seated right here with me at um, in in my office or at my kitchen table, what would be the logical things they'd want to know about Brunello di Montalcino, or about Rioja, or about the Barossa Valley, or about Marlboro, or or any other wine region in in the world? And so, when you think about uh, information that way, what do people want? And what to know, need to know, and what would be fascinating for them to find out or to learn about, then um, you you can begin to you you can begin to see the format of the book in your mind. But I, I guess too early on, because I think this way, I I just began doing lots and lots of sidebars, side boxes. It was a way of handling massive amounts of information and making them uh, kind of like nuggets that you could easily absorb. Otherwise it gets too cumbersome and tedious, right? Yeah. I think you're you're very succeeded at that visually (laughs) and the way it's laid out and informationally. Yeah. I think the, the, that kind of a format and that kind of learning approach has what um, is what has made the Wine Bible also like a favorite book among sommeliers because sommeliers are 
you know, they're often having to look things up very quickly or they're studying for an exam. Right. And the Wine Bible is laid out in a very easy to understand um, the information kind of way. Right. I, I agree with that. It's, it's very, it's very user friendly. You know, there's a nerdiness to it, but it's very user friendly. I mean, nerdiness as far as depth of information, um, but you pick it up and it's like I said earlier, it's not hard to navigate. Um, I mentioned you cover, you know, 23 countries. Um, and, and, you know, within some of them, like France and Italy, the U.S., I mean, there's a bunch of regions. In this edition, because of the changes in the four years and what you felt was important, um, you added a couple of countries and I guess a continent, South America. Um, tell me who is new in this book and why they went in. Well, South America was in the second wine Bible no, as I, well. But I, we had like Chile and Argentina, but like I was invited to Uruguay a couple of years ago by the government. And when I got there, I just couldn't believe how evolved the wine you know, yes. program was there. So, I mean, you, you up that, you know, game. I mean, you made a chapter South America separate of Chile and all that. Um, right. Yeah, that's true. And, um, you know, the, there are, we're just starting to see old but new again wine regions like Croatia and Slovenia really come online. And right. those wines are often Georgia. incredibly delicious. These were um, countries that were part of, in some cases, part of the former uh, USSR, um, the Soviet Republic. But um, after the fall of communism, it took a good 20 to 30 years for these countries to begin to once again produce the phenomenal wines that they did when they were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 1800s. Um, so there's that. But there's also, as you mentioned, um, you know, whole new wine regions. I absolutely love English sparkling wine. So Great Britain has a chapter, which is absolutely brand new, because even in 2015, when the Second Wine Bible was published, sparkling wine made south of London was not <laughs> something no. that any of us knew very much about. Oh, for sure. um, but now it's, uh, you know, it's an important part of, of the wine world. Um, the chapters in Asia on China and Japan are are much more expanded. Those two countries are rapidly becoming wine countries, especially China. So it's worth uh, paying attention to and expecting yeah. some interesting wines out of there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, good to know. Um, you added Israel. Why? Yes. Um, Israel, when I first started writing the Wine Bible, um, certainly Israel was already producing wine, but we didn't see an enormous amount of it in the United States. Um, you know, come the Jewish holidays, uh, right. which are around now. Those are different wines than what they're growing there too now. Yes. I mean, Israel has become... Um, a, a very sophisticated producer of Mediterranean varieties. And of course it is the Mediterranean. Right. And Israel has a profound um, history of wine. Some of the earliest archeological findings of the last decade have been in Israel. So um, it was definitely time to do Israel justice and to, um, and to, uh, I guess, help people to see that Israel is not the same as, you know, Manischewitz or right. the kinds Except. of, yes, the kinds of grapey kosher wines that um, once dominated <laughs> upstate New York. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. Um, uh, my friend Yannick Benjamin was... Uh, an ambassador for Israeli wines, and he was on the show, and we tasted through a lot of interesting stuff. 
and there's some compelling, you know, wines there. So that's definitely, you know, an interesting thing. Um, I'm always curious, you know, you talked about Israel, Great Britain, you know, all the, the more recent entries into the South American market. Some of the oldest winemaking countries are now, you know, getting the recognition. When you look at the traditional winemaking regions, and let's start with maybe the top three, you know, which is France, Italy, and the U.S., um, is there anything new or noteworthy when you talk about them? You know, maybe I can answer the question first. Like in France, you know, the Loire, natural wines, whatever, have become big. But are those regions similar now to what they were doing then? Or, you know, there are things... Um, I, I mean, you cover all of them in the book and you talk about that, but, you know, I want you to, you know, address that um, so people just don't think, you know, 22 years later, France is doing the exact same thing. Tell me what you think. Well, every wine region um, kind of advances its culture and its wine culture and um the great traditional regions of Europe, of course, do this. There are new techniques and new producers and the young sons and daughters of famous producers doing new and interesting things. And wine itself is, um, is changing as we understand more about the critical uh, aspects of making it and, and most importantly, the critical aspects of growing great grapes. So there's always something new and and fascinating in every wine region. Um, and I, you know, selfishly, I guess, I love to learn about those things. So when I approach a, a region like Spain or Portugal, where which is very, on the one hand, very traditional, right. nonetheless, I can in two or three days, fill a big notebook full of all kinds of new notes of things that are happening. Yeah, Spain's a good example. Um, there's a lot going on there region-wise. You know, what's old is new. You know, you even made that point with Eastern Europe um, and all of that. Um, one of the things in Spain's doing it, France certainly was at the forefront, um, Italy, um, you talk a little about natural wine in the book. Um, I want to get your take on, and I, I never know how to phrase it. I want to get your take on, you know, where you see natural wines or the natural wine movement today. You know, how, how do you define um, what natural Well, natural wine, wine has no definition. It, it, it does actually have it. There's no box to put it in. So, yeah. you know, and has it become part of the mainstream or is it getting there? So instead of defining it, you know, how do you discuss what natural wine is? Well, I should say that there is now a definition of natural wine in France, um, but in the U.S. and other countries, uh, it's not defined. But it is understood that natural wine means wine to which next to nothing is done. Right. And um, I would say that, you know, that it has in that, it has everything in common with great wines everywhere. Great wines are wines to which very little, the, as little as possible is, is done because the great wines of the world are those that, reveal their place and you can't you can't through you know <laughs> chemistry right they're farmed thoughtfully without all of those additions as they say yeah yeah so um natural wine is a, a kind of philosophic statement about the drinker's belief that it is better to be hands off and that i think is is a is a philosophy that everyone can share. You all right? Oh yes. Uh, you know, okay. I, I am, I live, of course, um, we were talking about, I live in Napa Valley and um, right in our little town of St. Helena, 
come the fall, what you might be hearing in the background noise are Are trucks full of grapes (laughs) that have been harvested. That's fun. And it gives you a true taste. I'm just amazed. My dog has not barked, you know, anytime during this interview. So he's listening. uh, Yeah. (laughs) He's actually sleeping. It's more me than you. Trust me that he's sleeping. Um, so here's what perplexes me. So, Karen, why why wouldn't we be interested in anything but wines that, you know, are natural in the right way? You know, why would we want to drink wines that aren't farmed thoughtfully, you know, where there's not a lot of addition in the cellar? I mean... Isn't because they're that- cheap. <laughs> Commercial wines, wines that have a lot of stuff done to them, are, are cheap. The way those wines are made is to take substandard grapes, often grapes that have some kind of a problem, right. and, in, and through chemistry... Um, Make a taste the sense, same every year or whatever. Yeah. And then, yeah, and but then that's not what them. you advocate or write about, right? No, no, definitely not. Yeah. Yeah. So there's always going to be, you know, that segment. So it's not unfair that we should be cheerleaders, you know, for thoughtful farming and winemaking um, on a go forward basis. It's better for you. It's better for the earth type thing. Absolutely. Okay. Um, do you see, and again, you know, we were, the box is kind of open, but what, what we talk about is wines that are natural. Are they more mainstream now? Do you think, do you see, you know, I don't really, um, I don't really know. Um, New York has a, a very active natural wine. um, Yes. Like Paris was 20 years ago. And yes. And so does so does France. Um, out here in Napa Valley, I think um, you know there's no wine bar that is a natural wine bar, but certainly yeah, the wine so bars that are here celebrate um, you know r- real uh, conscientious farming and a minimum of inputs into wine. Right. I, I I agree with that. Um, it's funny. You, it's a fair point. I mean, I would say in New York in the last five seven years, the only things of note that have opened have been all these natural wine bars. My friend Jorge Riera at Frenchette, who had one of the first natural wine bars five years ago, they just opened up in Rockefeller Center, which is really prime New York Midtown, and he has an only natural wine list, which is sort of counter to who's, you know, around there, all the offices and, you know, retail. So I thought that's interesting. Um, all right, a few things. I want to get to our wine list. I want you to answer those questions. But I I I wanna ask you, I kind of wanna end this segment of the interview with how you open your book and you answer the question very deliberately, but I want you to be a little more general, emotional or whatever. You ask what makes wine great. So let's end the interview with that question. You don't have to tick off the 12 things, but just (laughs) what Karen, what makes wine so great? Well, there are those 12 principles. Which, which you have to buy the book to know them. To You'll find get out, yes. So yeah. that's a teaser, but I'm going beyond that. Um, well, it is those things, though. I mean, that's what I look for when I'm so trying to def- uh, precision, distinctiveness, complexity, uh, a sense of non fruitedness, the ability to evoke an emotional response, right. balance, length. These are these are kind of overriding principles that are at work in the great wines everywhere in the world, not not solely uh, in one country or another. Right. And I think it's valuable to um, to have both an understanding of of your own subjective loves, um, 
But a lot of the wines that we all subjectively love are not necessarily great wines, right? They're just wines that we love for whatever right. reason. Um, okay. and, and that's fine. Um, but there is, I believe, uh, there are characteristics that truly great wines share. And um, yes, I think that's so important that I made it chapter one. Well, I think you, you mentioned two things. I think you mentioned technical and emotional you know, and taking off some of those 12 things. Um, so obviously, you know, making farming, but also what it does to you. Um, so I would encourage everyone for you to deeper understand what makes a great wine great um, is, you know, go buy the book. But if you're one of those guys that just goes into the bookstore and reads it and leaves, okay, better than nothing, but just buy the book. All right. So, Karen, we always uh, end the show with the wine list. We ask our guests five questions. We ask everyone the same five questions. We post them on social media. As I mentioned to you off air, our listeners love to hear what people like Karen McNeil are drinking, thinking, and doing with wine. So we're going to get into that. And like I said, I'm going to post it. Um, earlier in the show, I said you were on the 17th episode. I'm pretty sure you did a wine list. I'll try to do some comparisons. Um, I don't remember, and I'm sure you don't. So here's the first question. The first question is, what are you drinking now? What is Karen McNeil drinking now? What's in your fridge? What's interesting you? You know, do you make a seasonal change? You know, you go from whites to reds. You know, what 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 are, what are you drinking now? Are you researching well, anything? It's 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 not a uh, like that. I think for us here, because we because we are always writing about wine, we we have to taste a lot of it and. Um, we taste about, I taste about 2,500 wines a year. Wow. And um, so uh, what, what I, what's in my refrigerator is what um, was, um, you know, from that, that we usually taste around five in the afternoon and whatever was, were the best wines from that tasting are now what are in my refrigerators. Um, and then I go home and um, cook dinner and have them with dinner. Uh, All right. So but, the, the answer to that is driven by what you're always doing. You're tasting, yes. you're researching, and then you'll drill it down. So I think that's an answer in itself. Um, but you kind of led me to the next question. The next question is, what's Karen's favorite wine and food pairing? Not something obviously eat every night, every week, every month, but what's that ooh-ah wine pairing? Not that you would recommend to people, but what you like. I love um, champagne and a really creamy, creamy cheese. Wow. Um, I was, af <laughs> I forgot to tell you this. I was, gonna, I was afraid you were going to say champagne and oysters which is not allowed on the show because it's too obvious. Now, let's talk about that. So champagne has acid, the bubbles, you know, one of the greatest, most underrated wines as far as what people think, not what we know. Why does it work well with the creamy cheese? Because it's a bit like a yin-yang or a seesaw, you know, the creaminess and, and fat and salt in the cheese is so luxurious and then you splice through that with the the really racy acidity of the champagne so your palate is on this little seesaw going back and forth i i think that's great now when you're talking about creamy cheeses i mean are you going beyond brie you know what comes to mind when you said that any triple creme uh, okay. ch french cheese that type of cheese. Yep. That seems like would fit the profile. All right. Great answer. Um, hopefully you'll answer this. And by answering it, you're not excluding anyone or favoring. You're just citing a few things. Do you have any favorite wine restaurants and or bars, you know, places that have a great list, great vibe when you walk in, knowledgeable people, you know, killer wine list? Is there anything local or in your travels that's just a fun place? And like I said, if you mention something, I'll disclaim this for you. If they see you, they go, Karen, I listened to that podcast. Why didn't you mention me? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's because it wasn't, I'm just citing a few examples. That's why. 
Yes, you know, um, I have to say that I'll be able to answer this question better later because because of writing the book and also in part because of the pandemic, I have not we'll been out. out and about in a nope. lot of restaurants lately. Um, and then some of my favorite smaller restaurants have, co- of course, sadly closed. So, um, but with- All right, so I'm going to come back to you on this. Yes, please. Because that, I, I post this stuff. I also have it on uh, Instagram and on my sites where I have everybody's answers, you know, so you can go back to Raj Parr's answers from two years ago and see what he said. So I'm going to fill in the blanks. I'm going to stay with you on that. You just have to promise to remember and give me some answers. All right. Fourth question. The question is, and it probably was presented to you this way during the 17th show, what's your favorite all-time wine? Now, let me just disclaim this a little. When I asked that question, I was very curious about, hey, what's the rarest, most expensive wine Karen you know, drank and tell me about it? I'm less interested in that answer, and I'm more interested in the wine that became important to you, that was a gateway, that changed the way you thought about it, you know, that impressed you, that's important to you. Is there a wine or two that just stands out, you know, in your wine life that did or meant something? Well, all kinds of wines, of course. Um, it may be too many for you. Role. Um, but I... Um, you know, lately I have been tasting a lot of Willamette Valley Pinot Noir from Oregon. And I'm, I'm very impressed by those wines. They're just so sublime. And Pinot Noir is, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, it's the sexiest of all wines for sure. I agree. You know, that's what Burgundy is. Burgundy is sexy. So, you know, that's our, uh, we're doing it here. Um, that's a good one. I'll, I'll stay with that. So right now, that's, you know, what's important. All right, last question, and you should be able to answer this. I ask everyone to recommend to me best wine retail around 15, 20, 22 bucks. I want you to recommend a red. I want you to recommend a white. You could recommend a region. Like I think Muscadet is a great value for a white. Uh, Zinfandel, you know, can be had as a red. Give me... Give me in that price range because my kids are in their late 20s and they can't afford $50, $60 bottles, but they don't want to buy or give that supermarket wine that we were talking about. So how do you wow for $15, $20, $22? Bucks? Yeah, we have uh, – there's a section in Wine Speed called Steals. Ah. And those are all – every week, those are wines that are under $25. And they're from all over the world, um, all styles of wine. So, and if you go on the Wine Speed website, you can uh, you can look at every last deal we've ever written about. And okay, so it's, that, it's so very that's... quick and easy, and you'll find hundreds of them there. So, how long has Wine Speed been around? Since two thousand and sixteen. What month? Because I'm trying to figure if you stole my idea. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I don't think it's so. The, same thing. the whole idea of this is to hear from you, and I will point people towards Wine Speed, Thank is you. how to get you know great value at that price range. Because right. even if you step up to 20 22 bucks, you could still get a crappy wine. Um, oh, sure. You know, so that's important. All right. So that that's a good answer. All right. So Karen, like I said, I am going to post all these answers, um, so everyone, uh, you know, could could pursue some of these wines. All right. Let me do a quick wrap up because I know I got to let you go, and um, I want to get some info from you. So if you have a question, suggestion, wine happening or event, hit me up at Sam at the grape nation.com. That's Sam at the grape nation.com. Subscribe to the grape nation podcast on Apple podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. Um, leave a review. If you like the podcast, you can follow us on Instagram at S Ben Ruby and on Twitter at Ben Ruby. I know that can be confusing, but you can always get to us via the hashtag The Grape Nation to find us on both. We're on Facebook at The Grape Nation. 
as I mentioned, we will post Karen's wine list um, so that you could take a, uh, a deeper look at that. Um, so, Karen, if we let's talk about the book first. If we want to order the book, tell me the best ways you think we should order it. Yes. Uh, well, the Wine Bible is for sale, of course, in all bookstores and on Amazon. But if you want it uh, signed and um, personalized, I can, um, you know, and a lot of us want a personalized book for for giving uh, right. holiday gifts. You can you can get the Wine Bible very easily uh, by going again to either KarenMcNeil.com or WineSpeed.com. There's a little Wine Bible tab, and it will um, you'll be able to order the book right there and tell me who you'd like it personalized to. So you can just order the book there if you want, among other booksellers, and you can order a personalized copy. Yes. Um, so that's a great option. All right. Wine Speed, winespeed.com. Yes, exactly. That's where we're going to go to get the answer to the fifth question, which is wines around 15, 20, 22 bucks, right? So go to wine. We didn't talk about it, but you put your hand in designing stemware. Tell me quickly about that. Yes, these uh, they're called the Flavor First Collection, and um, it's doing extremely well. We just launched them about a year ago, and they're glasses that revolve entirely around flavor. Um, and uh, if you again take a look at the Flavor First Collection, you'll you'll see. Um, so, Sam, it has been really great talking with you thus far. All right. I'm going to let you go. I want to thank our guest, Karen McNeil. Um, look out for Karen's book, the third edition of the Wine Bible. Thank you to our engineer, Kevin, and everyone at the Heritage Radio Network. I'm Sam Ben Ruby, and you've been listening to The Grape Nation. The Grape Nation is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.